So I have 1001. We'll go ahead and get started. We're doing lecture 29, the human leukocyte antigens, oftentimes um, abbreviated HLA. So in this course, we've talked uh, previously quite a bit about HLA. So now we're going to dive into the inheritance pattern of HLA, um, how they're used, um, and when they play an important role. All right, so your HLA antigens are found on most nucleated cells of the body. Um, and then your, uh, they're divided into classes. So you have three classes and your uh, class one are even found on platelets. And these are the antigens that are recognized by the recipient's immune system. And this is what causes um, like tissue and organ rejection. So this is why it's very important that we uh, provide HLA matched tissues um, as much as possible. So I uh, took this chart from your textbook. It kind of describes all the applications of HLA. So we've talked um, previously about stem cell transplants. When we're doing stem cell transplants, remember this would be like bone marrow transplants. In bone marrow transplants, it's more important to have that HLA match to ensure um, for a true graft and to make sure your recipient doesn't reject it. So HLA is more important than ABO in bone marrows. Um, HLA is also important for solid organ transplants. Um, platelet selection, and we've talked about if your patient receives platelet um, donor units and they are refractory, meaning that following that platelet transfusion, their platelet count does not increase then that is refractory. So in that instance, it could indicate they have a platelet antibody or it could be a uh, HLA antibody, in which sense they would need HLA matched platelets. There are some specific disease associations with HLA specific antigen sites. Um, you guys have probably heard of the B27 HLA antigen site, which is associated with ankylosing spondylitis. I do have a disclaimer with that though, just because maybe you have the B27 antigen does not mean um, that you have ankylosing spondylitis. These antigen sites are just um, shown to be associated with that condition. Um, and then here's a DQ2, which is one of our class two antigens associated with um, celiac disease. I um, mean, so as we get further into this HLA language, um, the B represents the specific loci, and then the number represents the specific antigen site. Um, and so that will be a little bit clearer um, when we look at the chromosome in just a little bit. Um, so your HLA antigens are encoded by the major histocompatibility complex. This is located on the P arm of your chromosome six, the short arm. Um, so MHC is very important in immunology. You guys have probably talked about this in your immunology course. It has a um, few different roles. It recognizes self from non-self, so plays a role in recognizing foreign. Um, what's the right word? Foreign um, objects, whether that be viral, bacteria, it, and it's responsible for presenting these foreign peptides to the T lymphocytes. Um, and then it also can launch the body's immune response to these foreign antigens. All right, so here's your um, HLA nomenclature that I was mentioning a little bit earlier. So there's actually six loci that are responsible for many of our immune responses, and it's divided into three classes. You have your class one, who has loci A, B, and C. So the ankylosing spondylitis, the B27, is located at the B loci specific antigen site would be 27. So that's where the letters and the numbers come from. Class two is your DP, DQ, and DR uh, loci sites. And then class three contains your complement proteins such as C4, factor B, C2, uh, or C2, sorry, um, and tissue necrosis factor as well. And we're going to talk about each of these classes. 
All right, so your class one antigens are loci, loci A, B, and C. Again, found on most nucleated cells, um, even including platelets and your leukocytes. However, most nucleated cells, so that does not include the mature red cells. And again, these class one antigens are involved in whoops, distinguishing self from non-self. Um, so this plays a huge role in cellular recognition of viral and microbial proteins. So this um, diagram kind of demonstrates what's going on. So here you have a cell on the right side that has been infected with the virus. You have your class one antigens that typically seem to be on the um, inside of the cell. And so what they will do is they will code for a peptide that is specific to this virus. So your class one antigen is going to present the peptide to your CD8 T cells. And then what's gonna happen is, see here's your specific viral peptides by the class one antigens. Then your CDA cell is gonna launch an immune response in order to help destroy this cell. All right, um, so your class two antigens are found on antigen presenting cells such as your uh, macrophages, your monocytes, dendritic cells, B cells. Class two antigens are not on platelets. So this it plays a very huge role when you think about HLA matched platelets. We really only worry with matching class one antigens. So your A, B, and C loci matches for the platelets. Um, and then in class two antigens, your D antigens again are DR, DQ, and DP. And in this schematic, notice that your antigen presenting cell, difference from the class one antigens is that these are more um, exogenous. So while your class one antigens typically are on the inside of the cell and then will be pushed out on exposure to a virus or bacteria, the class two are on the outside. And so your class two antigens will prevent will present that peptide to your CD4 um, T cells. And then you have your class three antigens. These class three antigens are responsible for the activation of complement. Um, and you guys are well familiar with the complement cascade. So the class three antigens control the activation of C4, 2, C4, uh, C4, C2, and then factor B. And so playing a part in your um, MHC complex, once the complement cascade has initiated and then your MHC is initiated with C9, it will puncture a hole in the cell resulting in cell lysis. All right, so let's talk a little bit about how these HLA antigens are inherited they're inherited as a haplotype. And so each chromosome, so all of the loci on that chromosome are inherited as a set. Um, so you get one HLA set from each parent. Now these, think about these loci, they're very close together. So in um, instances, you could have some rare crossover types. So each person will have two haplotypes, one from mother, one from father. So this can actually be used in paternity testing. Um, they are considered codominant, so both will be expressed. Um, and then the haplotypes can be determined by testing. And we can actually look at um, familial studies for the genotypes. And so here's an example. Um, notice that here are your loci on each chromosome of the mother, all right, so on her two chromosomes, and then the father. Notice that in the inheritance pattern, all of these are inherited as a set, all right? And so here's your potential um, offspring HLA antigens being expressed. Notice that from the mom, the offspring could inherit the A2, B7, CW7, DR17, and DQ2. Um, and then from the father could get this whole set, A1, B8, CW3, 
DR4 and DQ5. Um, another option would be a, the A2 chromosome HLA expression from mother and then the A3 chromosome expression from the father. The thing you need to pay attention to here is that the whole HLA antigen is inherited as a set. So this whole loci is inherited. Um, so it's a set. With that being said, um, since each person inherits one intact chromosome from each parent, there's four different combinations possible. This is why any two siblings will have a 25% chance of being an exact HLA match. Um, the more siblings you have, the more likelihood one of your siblings is a complete um, HLA match. So if you have five siblings, you have a 99% chance of an exact match between the two siblings. Um, and siblings are actually better donors than parents because your siblings have a more likelihood of inheriting the same pattern, whereas parents, you might have one chromosome six the same, but you will have the other one being different. And then how we test for these HLA antigens, there's three areas of testing. The microlymphocytotoxicity test um, can detect your A, B, and C. These are your class one antigens. The mixed lymphocyte culture detects your um, class two antigens, and then some molecular-based technology using PCR, which is what is most commonly used um, now in our laboratories. So the Microlymphocytoxicity test, you can either use patient serum if you're trying to identify HLA antibodies, or you can use um, patient cells if you're trying to identify HLA antigens. Um, and so whichever patient sample you're using, you can incubate with, um, if you're using patient plasma, you will incubate it with a panel of known antigens, just like our um, IAT and our panel for red cell antigens. Um, or you can take patient cells and mix it with known antibodies for the detection of the antigen. And these um, uses microtiter plates. So if the patient has the component corresponding to the known panel, so let's say you're using patient plasma with known antigens on the cells, then the an an antibody antigen complex will occur. Then you're going to add complement. Once complement is added, it will um, damage the cell membrane and then you can add a dye and if the dye is allowed to enter the cell that has mean that the antigen antibody complex has occurred so they either have they're either antigen positive or antigen negative negative. and so this kind of just breaks it down um, you have isolated lympho lymphocytes all right so this would be your patient cells you have your antibody in the microtiter well. You're gonna add complement and dye. If the patient cells have the antigen and the antibody binds to that antigen on the cells, then complement is added. Complement will activate and, and puncture holes in that cell and the dye will be taken up by that cell. That means that either the antigen was there or the antibody was there depending on what you were taking, um, testing for. So the mixed lymphocyte culture, um, you can take your donor cells, they're treated with mitomycin to keep the cells from proliferating. The donor and recipient cells are mixed. Um, and this is for your class two um, antigens, remember. And so if the cells are not identical for those class two antigens, then your recipient T cells are going to um, be activated, they're going to be proliferating and launch an attack. Um, so you'll have blast formation. And then like I mentioned, molecular base using PCR is the most um, used detection um, and it uses DNA. This is what the HLA lab at UAMS does now, um, best for finding HLA matched bone marrow donors for transplants. So we're actually starting to see um, a lot more 
transplants being done, organ transplants, started first with skin, probably heard of skin grafts being performed, then it moved on to kidney transplants, and now pretty much they can transplant any type of organ, whether that be from lung, heart, pancreas, liver, and of course, bone marrow. So unless the donor and recipient are genetically identical twins in which they would have the same HLA match, um, those foreign antigens on the graft will elicit an immune response and that is what causes graft versus host disease. Um, so if you can't get a perfect match, it's, it's important to as match as many as possible with those organ transplants. And remember for platelets, we only concern with the class one antigen. So that's a little difference between HLA matched platelets and um, organ or tissue donations. Um, and so depending on the type of organ, some need a better match than others. So for liver, lung, heart, and pancreas, they do not require such a strong HLA match. Rather, ABO is more important there. Um, and definitely want to use, uh, you can use immunosuppressive drugs to prevent graft versus host as well, to keep the recipient from launching an immune response against the donor organ or tissue. Um, notice in your kidney and bone marrow, HLA is more important than ABO, all right? So we definitely want to try to match as many HLA antigen sites for kidney and bone marrow. The closer of an HLA match we can get, then the more successful that graft will be, the more successful that transplant will be. Um, and it's shown the more closer the match, the 80 to 90% survival rate of that HLA, uh, 47 survival rate if that HLA match is not achieved. And the better the match, of course, the better the outcome for the recipient, the fewer reactions, um, and the less severity of the reactions. So graft versus host, all right, so the rejection can be minimized by HLA match uh, matching. We can give steroids or other immunosuppressant drugs um, to help prevent the um, immune response against the donor recipient. Um, and if you're doing a solid organ, um, such as your um, liver, pancreas, heart, remember ABO is more important in those situations, followed by your class two HLA DR, followed by your class one B and class one um, A. But remember, for platelets, we only try to get as close of a match for the class one antigen, so which would be for platelets, your A and your B. For those bone marrow transplant patients, we want to try to avoid blood transfusions prior to their bone marrow transplant just because we don't want to sensitize them. We don't want them to build any HLA antibodies, which would affect how they accept their bone marrow graft, bone marrow um, donor cells. Um, for the bone marrow specifically, we want to try to match your class one, so your AB. A and B sites, and then and um, your class two DR, and then the C loci of the class one. So these are your class one and two, um, more important in bone marrow. And again, the ABO um, match is less important. So a type A patient, I mean, sorry, a type O patient could get a stem cell transplant from an O, an A, or a B patient. Um, and like we mentioned earlier about ankylosing spondylitis, that B27 antigen is associated with ankylosing spondylitis. You guys, if you haven't heard of that um, HLA antigen site being associated with ankylosing spondylitis before, make sure you know that. Um, that is a really good board of certification qu um, question. So like I mentioned at the beginning of this um, presentation, B27 is associated with ankylosing spondylitis, and while 96% of people with the B27 antigen have ankylosing spondylitis, that is not 
diagnostic of ankylosing spondylitis, it is just shown to be correlated with ankylosing spondylitis. So there's a disease correlation there, not diagnostic. Um, and if you guys aren't familiar with ankylosing spondylitis, it is a rheumatoid arthritis that uh, breaks down your spine. Um, it could be very painful. Patients oftentimes um, experience limited mobility. Um, and then the DR2, so this is one of your class two antigens, is associated with narcolepsy. So here's just a breakdown of some specific HLA antigens that are associated. Again, the keyword there is associated. It's, again, not diagnostic with certain disease. Um, so B27 is associated with ankylosing spondylitis that we talked to, but then it's also associated with Reiter's syndrome. Um, here's a couple HLA antigens that are associated with rheumatoid arthritis. You're one of your class two antigens, DR4. And then one of your class one antigens is the B27. The B8 is associated with Addison's. A3 has shown a strong correlations to hemochromatosis. Um, here's some associated with multiple sclerosis, um, juvenile diabetes mellitus, psoriasis, again, narcolepsy, and good pasture syndrome, that one of our class two antigens, DR2. Um, and so like I mentioned earlier, we can use the inheritance pattern of the HLA because you do inherit the whole chromosome six. So all of those loci sites are inherited as a haplotype. We can use those in paternity testing. Um, and if you combine paternity testing with your red cell antigens, you get about a 99% accuracy on paternity testing. All right, so throughout this course, we've talked about platelet transfusion and providing HLA matched platelets for our patients. Um, sometimes if your patient becomes refractory, meaning that that platelet transfusion does them no good, um, HLA matched platelets could be warranted for that patient um, or if they have a specific platelet antibody. So the more platelet transfusions a patient receives, the increased potential they are to build the antibody. So if they do develop that specific platelet antibody or that HLA antibody, um, by giving them HLA matched platelets, then we can improve the success of that transfusion. And it's just like red cells. Um, the HLA system is just like red cells. So in order to build the antibody, you have to have previous exposure. So the HLA antigens um, are very similar to the red cell antigens in that aspect, but the HLA antigens are not found on mature red cells. And so some larger facilities and your, probably your, don your uh, donor blood centers are performing cross-match platelets. Um, they're also performing HLA match for platelets. One way we can help reduce these um, transfusion reactions due to HLA antigens is we can make sure that they are leukodepleted um, and we can make sure that they are irradiated to prevent the proliferation of lymphocytes once in the recipient. Now we've talked about graft versus host disease before, um, a huge concern with patients that receive transplants, whether that be a bone marrow, liver transplant, or heart transplant. What's gonna happen is your lymphocytes in the donor are going to multiply and they will attack that um, donor tissue that was transfused. Symptoms of graft versus host include fever, rash, liver failure, diarrhea, infection, hypoplasia of the bone marrow, which ultimately leads to pancytopenia. Um, this is a fatal condition, and like I've told you guys before, it's easier to prevent graft versus host than it is to treat it. Um, and irradiation, it has dramatically helped improve um, graft versus host disease. So it's shown that irradiation um, between 1,500 to 5,000 rads will render 95% of those mature T lymphocytes incapable of replicating, meaning that they are unable to launch that immune response um, in the host.
and we can irradiate our red cells, we can irradiate our granulocytes, and we can irradiate platelets. All right, so the remainder of this lecture talks about the process of platelet cross-matching, platelet refractoriness. Um, we've talked about this before, being unresponsive to receiving platelet transfusions, meaning that your platelet count does not increase. And the way you monitor this is you will have to look at your patient's pre-platelet count, and then following the platelet transfusion, you'll have to have a um, post-platelet count as well, and seeing how much of an increase there was. So if you guys remember from a previous lecture, each unit of random platelets should increase the platelet count by five to 10,000. And again, the more transfusions of platelets you have, the more likely you are to become refractory because you're gonna build these HLA antibodies or you're gonna build these HLA, or sorry, platelet specific antibodies. There are some other reasons um, why patients might become refractory. Some non-immune reasons uh, might include the patient has DIC where the platelets are being rapidly consumed in the microclots. Um, maybe the patient has uh, splenomegaly, uh, bleeding or bruising. Maybe it was a product problem. Maybe it was the wrong ABO type where the, the donor platelets were destroyed by the recipient's RES system. Um, maybe that platelet count was too low in that specific product. Um, and that would happen maybe that if that product was near at the expiration date. Um, and then some immune responses, which we can help prevent um, alloimmunization to either class one antigens or alloimmunization to the platelet specific antigens like we've talked about. And that is where platelet cross matches come into play, HLA matched platelets can help address this refractoriness. Um, one of the issues that we talked about in the previous slide was refractoriness due to ABO compatible units. In blood bank, we typically are not as um, specific about giving ABO specific units. Um, so like a, a patient might receive a unit from a B donor um, so if your patient is refractory, you can try to give ABO specific compatible units and see if that makes a difference. Try to use fresher platelets. And then, um, of course, we could provide HLA match platelets to honor the patient's HLA antibody so that antibody would not attack the platelets. Um, there are some challenges in finding HLA match platelets. Um, it's very difficult to find a HLA perfect match in an unrelated donor. Um, sometimes even if you do find a low HLA match, there's only like, a, there's still possibility for failure there. Um, most of your donor centers will have a huge pool of um, HLA genotypes on your patients, on, on their donors to choose from. So if you provide your HLA antigen typing for your patient, um, and then the donor center is able to match as many of those HLA antigen sites as possible for the class one, remember, because we're talking about platelets. If you guys remember from the um, donor collection and product lectures in the previous module, we talked about platelets being collected from the whole blood process where multiple donor platelets are pulled together to get that therapeutic dose versus single donor collection using the apheresis technique. So that has um, helped improve the formation of those HLA antibodies or platelet specific antibodies because the recipient is exposed to less foreign antigens. Um, however, this does not totally eliminate sensitization. It has only helped reduce. And then again, leukodepleting is a good practice preventing the HLA antibodies. Platelet cross-match. Um, so Immucor has um, produced a process for platelet cross-matching. It uses solid phase testing and their name of platelet cross-match is Capture P. They also have um, 
a way you can do red cell testing as well. It's Capture R. Um, and so it has become the process of choice, Capture P for platelet cross matching. Um, and so what you can do is you can take patient plasma where these HLA antibodies, platelet antibodies are circulating and you can mix it with your inventory of platelets and find one that is compatible. This really helps um, in the predictive value of the transfusion being successful, 97% by providing platelet, um, cross-match platelets. All right, so the Capture-P uses these micro wells shown here in the image. Um, each well, you, each strip has eight wells. Um, and then the wells are, have a platelet binding agent attached on the inside of the well. And so how that works is, so here's an example, this would be your wet well, and here's your platelet binding agent. It's bound to the walls of that well already by the manufacturer. So it is provided that way to you. And then so what you're gonna do is you're gonna add your donor platelets, or if you're testing platelets, your patient platelets um, to the wells. Right, so then you're going to add your patient's serum or plasma where the antibody is, or if you're testing um, your patient platelets, then you would add um, commercial antibody to identify the specific antigen on the site. If the um, antigen antibody complex has occurred, that antibody will bind to those platelets that have been added. And then you're going to add indicator cells. Um, the indicator cells are red blood cells that are attached with anti-IgG. And what's going to happen is those indicator cells are going to bind to the anti-IgG that is bound to the cells. And so what you're gonna get is, you're gonna have this agglutination occurring throughout the well. So what that's gonna create, this is kind of opposite of your ABO testing, it's going to create a very hazy pattern, all right? And so when you look um, on the top of the wells, so this would be a positive reaction, right? Creating like a hazy um, agglutination versus a negative reaction, all the cells are gonna go to the bottom. You're gonna have a very strong cell button at the end, uh, at the bottom of that well. And that's why I said it's opposite than your ABO. So a very strong cell button um, indicates a negative reaction. And so just to give you an example of what that looks like. So notice these where the indicator cells have gone all the way to the bottom. So this cell, um, this well here, and this well, and this well, those are all negative reactions. And so remember, the antibody has attached to the cells that are coating the wells, and so we get agglutination, get this hazy pattern um, throughout the at the bottom of the well. So this, these are positive reaction here, 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 and here. So this is this is think about this opposite of when you interpret ABO reactions. Sorry about that. When you interpret ABO reactions um, using tube. All right, so solid cell button at the bottom indicates a negative reaction. The hazy pattern indicates a positive reaction. Um, and so I mentioned this earlier, but I just wanna make this uh, point to you guys. They, HLA antigens and antibodies are very similar to the red cell antigens other than what cells they're found on in that in order to build these HLA antibodies, you have to have been exposed um, through previous transfusions, platelet transfusions, pregnancies, um, very similar to building a red cell antigen antibody. Um, by providing HLA cross matches, we can help produce, we, or sorry, we can help prevent transplant reaction we can try to match as many of the six loci as possible for organ transplants, match as many of the class one antigens for platelet cross matches. Um, and then certain diseases have a strong correlation with specific HLA antigens, such as the B27 for the ankylosing spondylitis. 
Um, usually those disease correlations are immune disorders such as the um, ankylosing spondylitis or the rheumatoid arthritis, usually associated with some type of immune because these HLA antigens are involved in launching that immune um, attack. And then HLA platelet cross matches um, could improve the transfusion success if we do HLA matched. All right, so if your patient becomes refractory, HLA platelet cross matches could help ensure that that donor unit is successful in the recipient. So that concludes our summary um, of HLA. Um, if you guys have any questions, please uh, let me know. So I did uh, send out an email, but just so you guys are aware, um, I have new student interviews today. So while the schedule does say that we're going from 10 to 10, right? Yeah, 10 to noon, I'm only going to do the lecture um, 29 today. I will post lecture 30 and 31 for you to review on your own. That will keep us uh, in line and on schedule. And then we will resume with lecture 32 on Monday, March 30th. You guys stay up to date on your email um, as to whether or not we have face-to-face -face classes on the 30th, um, given the public health concern um, that's going on right now. So just stay up to date on your email um, on whether we meet on Monday the 30th. Um, I hope you all enjoy your spring break and um, please email me if there are any questions or concerns.